hope I'll finish in 45 minutes. I'll finish in 45 minutes. Uh, welcome everyone uh, on behalf of the trustees, director general and the staff of this ESMBS, a very warm welcome. We are glad that we could bring another interesting talk as part of our academic program to engage with scholars from fields of art, architecture, archaeology and various other fields. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Shikha Jain, uh, director of Drona and chairperson uh, Drona Foundation. Uh, today she will be talking about positioning the forts of Maharashtra for world heritage. Uh, Dr. Shikha Jain has an uh, extensive portfolio on cultural heritage of India that covers conservation, world heritage, and museum planning projects. As an international expert on world heritage, she has advised government organizations in Singapore, Malaysia, UAE, Myanmar and UNESCO offices at Jakarta, Indonesia and Myanmar. She has worked as a consultant to the UNESCO Delhi and represented Ministry of Culture India as a heritage expert on the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. She graduated in architecture from the prestigious School of Planning and Architecture, SPA, Delhi, followed by a master's in architecture from the Kansas State University, USA, and a doctorate from the Montfort University. She is Vice President ICOFORT, the International Scientific Committee of ICOMOS. She has authored several publications on cultural heritage of India and has co-edited uh, Conserving Fortified Heritage, Cambridge Scholars Publishing in 2016, and the Strongholds of Western India, Ports of Maharashtra, uh, Aryan Publication, Publishers, 2021. I now welcome Dr. Shikha Jain to deliver her lecture. Thank you and a very good evening to everyone. Uh, before I start my lecture, I would like to thank CSMVS and the uh, entire team for inviting me today to give this talk on the forts of Maharashtra. Um, I'm going to share my screen on the uh, presentation. I hope my presentation is uh, visible. Yes, it's visible. And um, I think during the presentation, I would just like to keep my uh, video off so that the sound is better and I will switch it on again when I finish for the question and answers. So a very good evening again. Uh, my talk today is focused on positioning the forts of Maharashtra for world heritage. And it's structured in three sections. I will first uh, talk about understanding India's military landscape and what is the status of uh, fortifications um, of India. Secondly, I will talk about what is the exceptional about Maharashtra forts and how do we understand the forts and all their elements uh, collectively and as well as individually. And lastly, I will talk about positioning the forts of Maharashtra for World Heritage nomination. The military landscape of India, if we look at it, uh, finds expression in specific nomenclature in ancient Indian texts. There are multiple terminologies for forts that emerge across languages and dialects, dynasties, and across time. Particular locations of fortifications were imbibed in the form and typologies of forts. For example, the water forts, hill forts, valley forts, and others as expressions of the local landscape translated into military strategy of the time, capitalizing on the location and the natural defense mechanism. So as per Shilp Shastras, we have these six kind of forts. Uh, God's fort are Devdurg, Giridurg, Vandurg, 
Jeldurg, Marudurg, and Mishdurg. And the map on the right shows the various kinds of fortifications that we have across the diverse uh, physiographic regions of India. If we look at the historical timeline, the earliest fortifications in India date from the Harappan period, which are found in archaeological remains of sites such as Dholavira in Gujarat, and even others like Banawali, Harappa, Kalibangan, Mohanjodaro, Kuntasi, Lothal, and Sukhothara. Fortified cities of Rajgir and Patliputra are, are found later in Magadh Empire from 600 BC to 600 CE, thus becoming a common phenomenon in India by 400 BC. All of these exist today only in the form of archaeological remains. Gupta period remains show evidence of brick fortifications in their cities, as we found, uh, uh, as we find these across 50 uh, sites, at least across India, such as the Sisupalgar and Chandraketugar as two important ones. Even Kushana period, we find brick fortifications like the Bhatinda Fort in Punjab is an example of that. And in the southern region, which was under the Satvahanas, with around 30 fortified cities spread in the Deccan and Andhra region. The Satvahanas battled back and forth with local rulers, Shakas, to take over the Konkan coast and Malwa area. And in the present Maharashtra region, one observes the presence of Rashtrakutas, Chalukyas, and Yadavas in the medieval period, as we notice in these maps uh, at the bottom. And finally, coming to, to the Maratha period, which would be the focus of this talk. If we look at uh, the fortifications, it is the political situation in early medieval period in India that resulted in massive fortifications and independent forts built in stone and bricks across the country, which are intact till date, most with later years of reconstruction. Uh, there are examples like Tughlaqabad in Delhi uh, and later Mughal forts of 16th to 18th century period, which were typically land forts located on river banks, showing a distinct deviation from hill fort typology, which was seen in Rajput and earlier Sultanate forts. The Rajput and Mughal forts show interdependence in development of architectural style and planning. And with the introduction of artillery in 16th century, there were several changes in the construction and design of forts. These changes were similar to the changes that took place in the West too, with the advent of gunpowder, that is lowering of walls, thickening of walls, further pushing of the bastions. Other examples that we see in our country are the hill forts in the northern region, Himachal Pradesh, Shambhu and Kashmir in case of Kangra and Nurpur, and typical form of Ladakh in case of uh, Bagso. There is a Zong typology of Arunachal fortified village, which is quite distinct and dating from early medieval period. And if we look at the southern landscape, 14th, 15th century was dominated by Hindu empire of Vijayanagara, kingdom that controlled a large part of the current state of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala. The fortified cities of Hampi and Chandragiri are for the capital of Vijayanagar rulers, and citadels show a re regional style essentially Hindu in character, with assimilation of some Islamic forms. The hill forts of Jinji and Chitraduk Durg reflect fortifications straddling across a number of hills and show a regional Hindu style with some Islamic features. On the western frontiers, the 17th century saw the rise of the Marathas and several hill forts were built, repaired and reconnected in Maharashtra state during the period, especially starting under Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj as already established by various authors. Except for Raigarh that was used as the capital of Maratha kingdoms and few other, the forts were more of defensive watch post of 17th to 18th century period. The Marathas were the first Hindu rulers to have built an island fort of Sindhu Durg in the 17th century, which was as a counter to the uh, Janjira fort, which I will show, be showing later by under the Siddhis. The medieval and post-medieval European forts were essentially coastal forts with a completely different form and defense mechanism from those of the medieval hill forts. And we see a number of these Portuguese uh, forts across the coast, uh, coastal line of uh, Southern India, also a bit on the west and the east. 
So if we look at the status of fortifications and the military heritage today, as per a current study carried out uh, for Niti Aayog, where we were mapping about 100,000 structures, it was uh, we could actually have a listing of about 6,524 fortifications, palaces, and military architecture across India. Among these, there are uh, ASI has about 490 which are protected, and the state archaeology has under about 574. But this still leaves around 4,500 forts, fortifications, and military structures that remain unprotected. Among these, uh, which I will show towards the end of my presentation, there are eight forts already on World Heritage List. Two are mobile forts as single sites, and six Rajput forts as serial property. Besides that, on our tentative list for UNESCO, we have one fort from Arunachal Pradesh, four forts of the Deccan as a serial nomination, and more, most recently, in 2021, we have 14 forts from Maharashtra on the tentative list as a serial property. Uh, here in this map, we can see that the large concentration of these forts is, and fortifications is there in Maharashtra, around 650 in number that is listed. This is a map showing uh, the, the various kinds of land, hill forts, coastal forts, and inland forts uh, across uh, the country. And again, it shows a larger concentration, both of the protected fort as well as other unprotected forts in the region of Maharashtra. And the map on the left clearly shows the kind of concentration there is of the coastal forts as well as the uh, Western Ghats forts, which are largely the hill forts type. So moving on, you know, from the Indian uh, military landscape, where we see that Maharashtra possesses one of the largest concentrations of forts and fortifications, we will now look at specifically at Maharashtra and the kind of fort typology it has. Uh, we have recently uh, authored and edited this uh, particular publication, which covers a large section of the fortifications of Maharashtra. And I, what I will be showing in this section is largely for, uh, uh, contributed by various authors, which is why I'm showing you this uh, page on the right. This includes the uh, uh, historian Pramod Mande, who's no longer uh, there now, but I was fortunate to actually experience and learn about the foods of Maharashtra during my first visit uh, with uh, 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 Shri Pramod Mande ji. Um, Besides that, we have a number of conservation professionals, Archana Deshmukh, Komal Poddar, and uh, 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 archaeologist, Mr. Tejas Karge, conservation architect Tejaswini Afale, uh, who have contributed, along with uh, Kirtida Onvala and Sasmit Achrekar and Malaji Rao uh, Jagdale. Uh, so we begin with the physiographic region. Uh, the reason I introduced the military landscape of India was to emphasize the fact that the landscape actually um, is uh, very critical and crucial to the forts typology as uh, the, the clear in intention during uh, military controls is how to uh, manage the entire landscape, including trade routes, economy, as well as control for defense. So uh, Maharashtra has a very interesting landscape, as you can see, uh, because of the Sayadri Hills that actually divide the coastal area uh, from the coastal area on the left to from the Deccan Plateau uh, on the right side or the east side. And this uh, actually leads to uh, a, an emergence of a very unique typology of uh, forts and fortifications and a complete network that was capitalized for the defense of this particular region and even for expansion of Maratha empire. So if we look at these, you can see uh, the concentration of forts. In fact, the total number of forts is somewhere between 628 to 650. We have a list of forts uh, with the names, but they are yet to be tabulated and placed on the map because a physical verification is required. But we could actually uh, map 293 of these forts, which you can see on the map. And you can see the concentration again. The blue ones are uh, largely the sea fort, or the, uh, the island fort. There are very few island forts, but largely coastal area forts. Um, then the hill forts, and finally the green ones, which are on the Deccan uh, 
plain, which are largely uh, land forts. And these, when I'm saying forts, it's, it's also fort, fortification, smaller watch posts, because the entire network is there. So it's the main fort, the uh, secondary fort, and any other you know, watch post that would go with that. This data is based um, on, uh, you know, our own research as well as uh, the book published by Durg Maharishi Pramod Maruti Mande, um, which is an encyclopedia of 4,000 plus forts and palaces in India. And he himself had traveled and seen about 1,000 forts across India. Uh, so it's the if we see the location of forts is is largely based on the physiography and the typology of course comes from that whether it's hill fort or island fort based on the physiography and also from the cultural zones so we can see the konkan area is largely the uh, coastal forts whereas desh and khandesh area would largely be the hill forts and marathawada and vidarbha would largely be the plateau and the land forts and the other uh, point that determines the location of the forts is the trade routes because like i said it's really you know how you control the trade and economy of a particular area and we see that in in case of Maharashtra very well, you know, since the ancient trade route times and so Para as a port uh, was functioning. Um, so these are these were important trade routes, and some of them still uh, existed during the medieval times, and that's how these uh, strategic forts and fortifications were located. So I will start uh, with the coastal and island forts of Maharashtra. I'm not going to explain uh, each and every fort. I'm just going to show you examples of each typology and what are the key features so that you get a general idea of what is the uh, what are the elements in each particular typology. So I will just show one or two examples of each. This one of Murud uh, Janjira, one of the most uh, famous island fort which is uh, largely remained indomitable and could not be conquered was under the Siddhis historically. And uh, there were several battles with the Marathas, but this was a fort that was very well protected by the Siddhis and also because of the way it was designed uh, uh, with the bastions and because of its particular location, you could actually see the enemy coming from any side. There was no way uh, that uh, someone could attack the fort without uh, being observed. So it, it really sustained for a long time. And as a counter to these, uh, the Marathas, beginning with uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji, uh, built other island forts as well as coastal forts to completely protect that coast from the overseas uh, uh, powers and attacks. So this is a mid 18th century um, uh, uh, painting uh, of uh, uh, actually a map of the Janjira fort, which was uh, probably prepared during the time, one of the wars between the Marathas and the Siddhis. And the map is has the Modi script, which was actually used during Peshwa time. So it's a later Maratha period uh, map uh, looking at, you know, the particular uh, attack and how to, uh, how it was uh, performed, like the, the company the complete uh, uh, war during the that particular time. However, this there is no exact dating of this map. It is currently at the Raja Dinkar Kelkar Museum. So who prepared it and uh, exactly which year is still not determined. But it shows the planning of uh, the uh, Murud Janjira quite well. And the locations of you know, the main palace of the Siddhi at the back and the central area, uh, which was used for control. If we look at the Konkan military landscape, and uh, we see that uh, Maharashtra has one of the longest uh, coastal uh, uh, line of about 740 kilometers. And this is inundated with the sea forts, including the coastal and the island forts. So this is a mapping attempted by Archana Deshmukh, where you can see that the entire Konkan coast is divided into three regions, the upper Konkan, which has around 30 forts, uh, the central Konkan, which has again 25 forts and fortifications, and the lower Konkan, which has about 18 forts. So again, the, the point that one is emphasizing here is that it is how the important ghats and passes through the Western ghats 
uh, were had strategic uh, locations for these ports as outposts just to control the important trade link between the ports, trading centers, and the coastal forts. Sindhudurg is one of the island forts that was built by Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj uh, to count as a counter to uh, Janjira Fort. And it is really an impressive uh, fort. Again, one of the uh, rare ones that could not be uh, captured. It was built in 1668 and it has an amazing, amazing bulwark of defense in the raging sea waters. It has ramparts of about two miles in length and 12 feet thick. The walls are low ranging from 29 feet to 30 feet and there are 24 bastions placed within the fortifications, generally semicircular with fine embrasures for cannons with a flat seat on the parapet. The entrance of the fort Fort is at the northeast corner with 45 staircases leading from inside to the top of the wall. And you can see this particular uh, entrance, which is uh, sort of a concealed entrance in Sindhudurg. This fort is under the jurisdiction of the Archaeological Survey of India, as also is the previous fort that I showed, uh, Murut Chandira. Another coastal fort which is a coastal or sea fort because it's not completely an island fort. It is, a, a, it is only uh, open to waters from one side is the Vijay Durg. And this is a historic map of the Vijay Durg where you can see the layout and the double fortifications with the, um, the structures inside the fort laid out. It's an 18th century map uh, from the uh, CSMVS Museum itself. Uh, this is a view of the Vijayadurg. You can see the bastions and the walls uh, along with the loopholes as visible from the sea. And this is uh, from the other side where you have the approach from the road. So it's sort of uh, the entrance is actually from just behind these uh, small cottages that you see, the road that leads to the main gate and you enter the fort. This is a closer look of the bastions. Uh, it was also called Gheria. And I mean, the term Gheria is also used to define boundary of a fort uh, in uh, Marathi. And you can see on a close up the kind of uh, solid walls, which would be very difficult to break in. And it is, again, one of the more significant fort, which was used for defense several times, besides being a trading uh, port also. And this is an inner view of the fortification. So you can actually walk along these fort walls and the, the ground and inner structures are inside completely protected. There has been further research on Vijaydurg and similar forts. And uh, if we look at underwater archeology, span um, you know, there have been a, a certain findings uh, which look at the dockyard that could have been uh, part of the Vijaydurg and also a stone anchor that could be used uh, with the wall of the dockyard, along with the cast iron slingshots that were found in the waters. Um, another mapping of forts of Mumbai, this has been attempted again by one of the contributors, Komal Poddar, and you can see uh, the number of forts in the Mumbai metropolitan region, as well as forts in Greater Mumbai, where you have the main fort, secondary fort, fortified outposts. These are largely, you know, colonial periods, Portuguese or British, and not uh, much of Maratha forts in this area. You can see the kind of uh, section below that actually indicates uh, that the extents, uh, it, it actually indicates that the extent of the fort wall is related to the height at which, which uh, the hill is or the outcrop is where the fort is located. So generally, if you have a higher space, then the fort wall uh, construction would be lower. The extents of Mumbai and Greater Mumbai together consists of uh, 25 historical military fortifications, and some of which are still intact, bar barring few that were raised in conquest. Mapped as main fort, secondary fort, and fortified outpost. And this is another map, mid 18th century map, which shows Garkalyan, uh, and it is um, actually showing. Uh, uh, a map of the Peshwa period showing the uh, ships docked near the port. 
with the fortification uh, behind. Uh, moving on from the sea and coastal uh, forts, uh, I will talk about hill forts of Sahyadri. So again, if we look at the map on the right side, which is prepared by Ketida Onola, it shows the way uh, the circular uh, concentrated uh, areas are actually the uh, parameters uh, till which the fort can actually observe or be guarded. So you already, you, you can see that there is a central fort in each case, and then there are surrounding small forts, which would be like frontier forts protecting the main fort, like the Raigarh and Rajgarh, which were the capitals. Uh, so this, this particular map shows a complete line, both of the coastal forts and inside on the Sayadri, how the hill peaks are used for the main central fort and surrounding frontier forts for defense purpose. Uh, one of the most important forts is the Rajkot fort, recognized as the first political uh, base of Hindavi Swarajya. It was formerly known as Murmur Dev. And it is a hill fort situated in the Pune district of Maharashtra was the capital of Maratha Empire under the rule of Chhatrapati Shivaji for almost 26 years, after which the capital was moved to Raigarh Fort, which I will show later. This fort is considered as the only fort that was that, that which was occupied the longest by Chhatrapati Shivaji and hence has stood witness to many significant historic events, including the birth of his son, Raja Ram Chhatrapati and the death of his queen Saibai, the return of Shivaji from Agra, and the burial of Afzal Khan's head in the Mahadarwaza walls of the Bale Kila here. The fort was one of the 17 forts that uh, Shivaji Maharaj kept when he signed the Treaty of Purandar in 1665 with the Mughal general Jai Singh one, leader of the Mughal forces. Um, I think, I mean, this number may vary because at some point they say 17, but I actually it was only 12 forts that were finally retained by him. But uh, Rajkar and Raigar, two capitals were definitely the ones that were retained. Um, it is said by James uh, Douglas in his book of Bombay about Rajkar and Torna that they occupy an unchallengeable position and are unconquerable, thus facilitating Shivaji Maharaj to have a wide scope to expand the boundaries of his kingdom. It has a very interesting setting. You can see this is an aerial view, um, a plan view, and you can see the fort or the Balikila is in the center, and there are three uh, sites that are extending, which are the machis or the ground where, uh, you know, other structures can be built, the lower ground area, whereas Balekila is the higher area. And you can see this is a close up. So this is the central Balekila area where you see in the central mound, the main fort structures are uh, made and the ends are actually the, uh, the three triangular ends is what is extending into the machi or the platform area where construction, other, other uh, you know, supplementary structures are made. This is an aerial view here. You can see the mound in the center, which is the Balekila and the three marches extending on each side. Again, a closer look at the Balekila where you can see the uh, structures constructed. And the three marches, this is Suvela Machi on one side. Uh, the Padmavati Machi uh, along with the Padmavati uh, water body. This is a close-up of the uh, Padmavati tank. And the last one, which is the Sanjeevni Machi. So you can see how the natural contours of the hill uh, helped in shaping up these uh, ramparts and uh, bastions, which would be very difficult to uh, climb up or to attack. And these points really served as nice watch posts where which could uh, uh, which could help in controlling the entire area and the vision of who is moving into towards the fort. This is a view of the Bale Kila. Uh, and you can see the fortifications and structures on the top, which would be very difficult to uh, reach by the enemy. This is an example of the steep slopes, which would be, of course, it was largely the basalt hills were like this, but they were further uh, cut and chiseled to, to keep them um, as steep as possible so that the enemy would not be able to climb. 
Uh, this is the Pali Darwaza, uh, the entry point in Rajgarh Fort, which moves into a bastion area and uh, on the left that you see, and again opens into the second Pali Darwaza, which you see out here on the right. And you also have a view of the uh, fort, uh, Torina Fort across, which I had uh, shown on the map, uh, which showed mapping of all the forts. So this is one of the hill forts that was uh, worked as a frontier fort for Rajgarh and also Raigarh later, because it's located in between the two. So this is the view of the Torana uh, from the Pali Gate. The, the second capital, which was Raigar, originally called Rairi, the fort is built on a large wedge separated from the main range by a ravine. The natural defenses of this fort were further strengthened by ramparts and bastions by way of almost vertical scarps, like the kind you see out here. There were two main gates, both flanked by bastions, Nana Darwaza and Maha Darwaza. And the top is fairly flat and there are ruins of number of buildings uh, dating from the 12th century. It was the seat of the family of a uh, Paliagar. In 1479, it, it passed to the Nizam Shahi rulers and continued under them till 1636. And in 1648, it was given to Chhatrapati Shivaji for his permanent capital. An actual shifting of the capital to Raigar took place in 1670. After the death of Shivaji in 1680, the glory of Raigar declined and finally it was taken over by Colonel Prother on the 10th May 1818. This fort is under the Archaeological Survey of India under the central government. You can see this view of the twin bastions of Raigar that conceals the Mahadarwaza. So in each case, like we saw in Sindhudurg also, in Raigar, a similar kind of, you know, uh, two bastions or uh, uh, walls at very close uh, quarters would be actually concealing the main entrance. And this is a view of the Mahadarwaza on the left as we move in between the bastions. And on the right side, you see the view from the other side as you climb up um, through the Mahadarwaza. Uh, and once you enter, we you see the Queen's quarters, uh, which are largely as archaeological remains. And there is still uh, research going on to uh, figure what exactly these quarters uh, uh, contained. And they are being currently mapped uh, uh, with the, uh, by the Archaeological Survey of India and the state government team. Uh, this is uh, the Balekila wall and Minar as you enter the gates and an example of how uh, these fortifications are still living heritage sites as we see in the coronation festivities uh, in Raigar, which uh, happens every June annually, where you see a large number of people that vary between two lakhs to six lakhs, which who finally come for the coronation. So this is a very unique uh, aspect of uh, the forts of Maharashtra, uh, because if you see, compare it with other forts across India, you will not find this kind of associational value that they have because of their reverence for Chhatrapati Shivaji. It's almost like a pilgrim spot, you know, where, where you have, where you go to pray like in temples. Whereas in the rest of India, you do not find this strong association with any military architecture or fortifications. Uh, they are largely as monuments for tourism or museums. Uh, and this is a display of um, the martial arts during the coronation ceremony in June. The bazaar pate, which shows the sort of shopping area that would be there historically uh, for, uh, you know, uh, one can understand the trade and economy and how these trading routes would would require uh, these kind of spaces uh, where people could uh, buy the stuff once it reaches a particular area. So these, these two are the most important hill fortifications. Of course, there are others, and I'm just going to show you a few. Uh, Pratapgarh is one where uh, this is a watercolor painting of the view from the fort of Pratapgarh. Um, and this was built in 1656 to commemorate the victory of the Maratha king Chhatrapati Shivaji over Afzal Khan, who was a general of Adil Shah of Bijapur. In, in to total, 
you can see again, you know, a similar machi uh, that we have in Pratapgarh and how it extends to become a, a, like a watch post. Uh, this fort of Pratapgarh is situated at a height of 1,080 meters, one of the highest points of uh, Sayadri, and commands spectacular view of the surrounding countryside. And it has double walls with corner bastions, gates with studded iron spikes, and two deep mall or lantern towers in the lower fort, which were hung with lanterns to form uh, beacons. And this was uh, beacons. This, this was at the time uh, during the British period, as is described by them. Um, you see in this particular view, again, the Mahadara Darwaza of Pratapgarh, how it is hidden by two bastions and a narrow passage that takes you up. And another, you know, defense mechanism, which is like the armory fortification uh, called the Chilkati Tatbandi. Tatbandi is the armory fortification, uh, which you see the, uh, the bastion right on top in Pratapgarh here. Uh, Panhala was another historic fort that was significant, very significant. Uh, it was on the spur of Sayadri Hills, about 12 miles northwest of Kolhapur, and probably found initially by King Bhoj in 1192 and 1209. These massive perimeter walls were over seven kilometers in circumference, and set in the wall were three magnificent double gateways, which were reached by long flights of stone steps. We, what we see here is just uh, one archival image from the British Library. And uh, uh, a large extent, extent of uh, Panhala still remains, the fortifications and especially the, the gateways, which are in uh, good condition. On the right side, you see a map of uh, Panhala, which was actually at the City Palace Museum, Jaipur, because during the dialogue between Aurangzeb and uh, Chatpati Shivaji, it was, um, you know, the Savai, uh, Mirza Raja Jai Singh uh, of uh, Amir and Jaipur area, who was actually uh, carrying on with the dialogue and the negotiations on behalf of uh, Aurangzeb. This is another view of, of a fort, uh, Lohagar, which is uh, also the, at the crest of a steep hill with bhaja caves cut mi uh, mid midway. Lohagar overlooks one of the most picturesque valleys, and it is believed to be have been built in the 14th century. It has a very strong line of fortifications and successive arch gateways. And it is flanked by a system of double bastions, as you can see out here. So you have, you know, one at the lower level and another one at, at the top level, which were very uh, significant in terms of defense. This fort is also under the Archaeological Survey of India. So these uh, were some examples of hill forts. There are several um, more on the Sayadri, which are equally significant. Um, and looking at the immense number of forts, it's quite a challenge when one is selecting them for nomination on the World Heritage List of what to select and what which one to leave out, because each has a very significant history of its own and a historic layering that is important. Uh, lastly, moving on down to the plains, you know, the Deccan Plateau. Uh, this is a mapping done by Tejaswini Afale, which is uh, where she is looking at the sort of unknown or unmapped forts, uh, not studied so much, uh, except for two of the forts here, Dalatabad and Naldurg, which are quite well known. And uh, Dalatabad, of course, is a completely different genre of fort and not doesn't uh, get classified under, under the Maratha, typical Maratha forts. It was not part of the network. And uh, it was uh, it is known to have been uh, uh, governed by different people, uh, by different dynasties, including uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq when he shifted his capital from uh, Delhi. Uh, to uh, Dalatabad. So it has been built, rebuilt, strengthened, and enlarged, and many features were added uh, along with innovation of gunnery here. Uh, and it is, it is very significant uh, in terms of its architecture because it shows uh, layers of fortified uh, fortifications uh, since a long time. You can see in the map itself, the kind of planning it has and the fortifications and the moat around it. The Naldurg, which is again, another significant port among, the, among this area of uh, Maratwara. 
It is the second most significant, largest, and well known fort of this area after Dolatabad, and it was one of the most fortified strongholds in medieval Deccan area. It is constructed, uh, as you can see, above a ravine formed by Bori River, uh, which is going around the fort. And it is associated with King Nal of the, you know, story, romantic story of Nal Damayanti. Uh, historically, it was under the Bhamni rulers and before that, even uh, Chalukya period and with the Adil Shahi and Nizam Shahis. And it continued to be significant during middle Mughal period and later Nizam of Hyderabad till independence time. So you can see again the, the uh, walls, uh, the fort walls, along with the loopholes and uh, the strong fortification being a land fort. What was important was that it largely depended on it largely depended on artillery for its defense and not so much on the natural features as we see in case of the hill forts. So you required more number of artillery uh, spaces and it was designed to be defended by more manpower. If we to if we summarize, you know, the Maratha uh, fortifications, what is the significance? Because what we see is that you have some very important forts like Murud Janjira or Dalatabad, which are significant and have se several layers of history along with the um, architectural features, which are quite unique, and uh, including even uh, Rajkar and Raigar, which are you know forts in themselves, which are of great significance. Yet what is most important in this Maratha forts is that there is the network that they form. These are excellent examples of how existing terrain was used for developing the guerrilla warfare strategy by Chhatrapati Shivaji and the Maratha army to combat imperial power of the Mughals on the land and the European coastal powers from the seaside. Among the military landscape of India, this warfare strategy of the Maratha Empire clearly stands out as one of its kind to be showcased in the world. If, we, if you recall, you know, the historic chronology and the earlier maps that I showed you, we have representations on the World Heritage List uh, from the Mughal period as well as the British period and even, uh, you know, regional representations of the Rajput forts. Yet, we do not currently have any significant representation of the Maratha kingdom, which as we saw was, you know, one of the largest uh, 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 kingdom in, in this particular period from the 17th to the 18th century and uh, mid 19th, I would say. So it's largely uh, what is exceptional about these forts. Individually, there may be one or two forts which may have some exceptional features, but it is the collective history and you know the narratives of the Maratha military landscape, the defense uh, that could expand into building an empire which was pan India and could sustain for more than a century is what is truly unique and needs to be highlighted. And in that sense, I mean, this was of course initiated uh, by Chhatrapati Shivaji and continued uh, later by the Marathas and the uh, Peshwas. So it's basically this significant aspect that one could look at showcasing um, at the world level or for the world heritage nomination. Um, what is interesting is that there are a lot of records and archival material, including the Purandar Treaty between uh, uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji and uh, Aurangzeb, which was drafted by Mirza Raja Jai Singh. And in this, it was clearly recorded that out of the 35 forts that belong to uh, uh, that belong to Shivaji Maharaj, there were 23 that were negotiated and taken up uh, by the Mughals and 12 that were retained by him. It would be interesting to look at those 12 that he particularly retained because that would actually be, you know, his strategy on how they can be used to gain back the uh, the lost ones. So those would be the most uh, significant fortifications from the military point uh, as per uh, Shivaji's uh, military strategy. 
this is a display of the Purandar Treaty. The original Purandar Treaty is in the Bikaner State Archives in Rajasthan. And what you see here is a display of the treaty, which was recently done in 2020 uh, in a museum designed by us. You can see the entire timeline of the um, you know, treaty and what uh, went through uh, between Chhatpati Shivaji and Aurangzeb, that complete dialogue is there, including uh, the vakil, uh, uh, you know, uh, documents that you see on the right when he was, um, uh, this all is being reported from Aurangzeb's uh, darbar. So uh, this is a point that leads us to, you know, what we would look at uh, if we are going into position uh, the Mahara forts of Maharashtra for world heritage. We, if we look at the, uh, you know, in context of India, we already have Mughal forts as world heritage sites, uh, Agra fort and Red fort, both are world heritage sites. So there is a good representation and also, the Rajput hill forts of Rajasthan, these were uh, inscribed, all six in one series, and it's, it's a new kind of, uh, um, you know, way of nominating because earlier UNESCO was just uh, um, looking at singular nominations, but uh, since the last uh, more than a decade now, they have actually started looking at serial nominations where this, a series of such uh, properties can join and they can narrate their outstanding universal value would be of the region or of a particular story of, you know, uh, uh, a historical period, era, or a geographical area in case of a natural heritage. So this kind of serial nomination really helps us in narrating, you know, uh, the complete history as well as the culture of a particular area, or it could even be pan-India. And it's important to not look at singular nominations now, but look at such collective aspects. And specifically in case of Maharashtra, it seems uh, well uh, justified. Uh, in case of Rajasthan, in a similar manner, there were these six uh, massive six hill forts, which are architectural manifestations of Rajput, Vela, bravery, feudalism, and cultural traditions. And in a similar manner, they were mapped along physiographic regions, looking at the unique values. In total, they had 200 plus forts. They were shortlisted to 54 and finally 24. And it was finally the six forts that, that were really unique and outstanding and were contributing to the, to the narrative of uh, Rajput Velar history and represented the best uh, of each area, region, and principality that was selected finally. So this is an exercise currently. I mean, you have the Deccan forts also on the tentative list. So any serial nomination needs to go through this exercise. And Maratha military architecture in Maharashtra is a serial nomination currently on the tentative list where 14 forts have been selected by the government of Maharashtra. And they are uh, proposed to be nominated under criteria two, criteria three, and criteria four of World Heritage, which defines its outstanding value. So under criteria two, they represent Maratha ideology in architectural planning based upon best utilization of hilly terrain and sea, including rock cut features, construction of perimeter walls in layers on hilltops and slopes, temples, palaces, markets, residential areas, and almost every form of medieval architecture. So the criteria two is about you know, the exchanges and various time periods uh, and the history of these forts that it recognizes. Criteria three is about the architectural expressions of Maratha gallantry, heroism, and cultural traditions documented in several contemporary records of the medieval period. And uh, the social set, set up after arrival of Delhi Sultans, Mughals, and Rajputs and their distinguishing Maratha style of architecture, which synthesized both the Sultanate and Rajput architectural traditions. And it's an exceptional testimony of uh, the traditions governed by the landscape in Maharashtra. And lastly, criteria four, it's about an outstanding example of a traditional human settlement land use and representative of Indian culture. So it's about the Mar local Maratha warrior clan uh, based upon welfare, well-being of the subjects, the, the idea of uh, Swaraj, you know. So another, uh, you know, justification for selecting these forts was also to uh, look at the ones that really tangibly qualify for this particular idea or concept of the Swaraj, which was started by Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. 
It basically represents a very interesting phenomenon in Indian history that remains unparalleled for its military ingenuity. Uh, of course, this is what is currently on the tentative list. Now, the biggest challenge is how to move forward to the nomination, because uh, with whatever experience I have seen in, in case of uh, nominating of a world heritage, you need to justify all these and to justify for each of these 14 votes, all these criteria is going to be quite challenging. And the other aspect besides the, besides the outstanding universal value is also the conservation and management of all these votes. Which is which is a bigger challenge in our, in our current context. So what we need to look at and possibly for the government of Maharashtra and the stakeholders involved is review these fourteen forts. Really question what is the outstanding universal value of the Maratha military landscape? What are the attributes you know which could be qualifying each criteria and outstanding universal value? Does each fort, each of the 14 fort in the series has all these attributes? Because even if uh, one, if something is found missing in one, it actually uh, jeopardizes the entire uh, listing for the for all the 14. Does the series and each fort have integrity and authenticity? So this is very important, whether they are as per their original form and being maintained as such. And what is the state of conservation and management for these selected forts? So the, these are the way uh, uh, the you know uh, questions that they need that need to be reviewed while preparing the nomination dossier and proposing the forts, whether it should be fourteen or one more should be added or removed or. You know, so this exercise still needs to be undertaken at the next level of uh, preparing the nomination dossier. And this is my last slide where I'm just mentioning that the conservation and management of votes with stakeholders is really critical. Um, in a very um, good initiative, uh, currently the Fort Federation of India as an organization has been formed. Uh, with its based in base in Maharashtra by uh, Chhatrapati Sambhaji Rajaji, the descendant of uh, uh, Shivaji Maharaj and also a Rajya Sabha member, but it also has uh, uh, you know directors from various uh, different uh, disciplines, uh, tourism, archaeology, and their main focus is really looking at you know the larger number of unprotected forts also. Um, and how to uh, conserve and keep them from becoming a uh, ruin like in the current scenario. Uh, also, in terms of international uh, recommendations, the ICOFORT, the uh, uh, International Scientific Committee on Fortifications and uh, uh, Military Structures has um, a draft charter that can be used uh, while maintaining or conserving that has guidelines even for maintaining the military landscape of uh, certain areas besides the individual properties of forts, fortifications, and defense mechanisms in each. So thank you. I will stop sharing and I'll open my video so that if there are any questions, I can take that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jain, for such a comprehensive uh, talk about the military, uh, uh, about, about the forts of Maharashtra, not just Maharashtra, but you also helped us understand, you know, the forts and the various classifications of it, because uh, it, whenever we think of, you know, the past of India or any uh, uh, of uh, any state, we think of the kings, we think of the forts, we, but unfortunately, a lot of these forts are uh, not maintained uh, properly. They are in a very uh, bad state. So congratulations for taking up that challenge and, you know, and uh, doing such a wonderful job. Many of our um, participants have also congratulated you for the work and also for the talk that you have just delivered. Uh, you have you. literally teleported us back. Uh, military history, if I understand correctly, is um, is in India. It's still not that well studied. Is will be will it be cor correct to say that? Sorry, will it be correct to say military history? The military history, the war 
taxpayer, how it was conducted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not well studied in India, probably in vernacular languages, but not so much in the mainstream. Will it be correct to true. say that? True. Yeah, that's true. I think military landscape is just a recent, uh, you know, new uh, dimension that is being explored. And this was done. I mean, I forgot to mention it was the National Scientific Committee of uh, ICOFORT. As the convener of that in 2017, I initiated that. And the current convener is Archana Deshmukh, who's taking it forward. So we have a very uh, strong national scientific committee. And there are about 20 plus members of ICOMAS India who are now taking up uh, this exercise, including, you know, uh, even there is so much regional variation in the glossary of fortifications, you know, how you call Buruj or Burj or it changes in Gujarat, Rajasthan and Maharashtra. So, you know, we need collective uh, studies from each region to really establish parameters for each kind. And it's, it's a process that has started. I hope it will, you know. Uh, soon take off. Uh, fortunately, in Maharashtra, I feel there are, you know, there that local association with forts is so good. So, like local historians, uh, Sri Pramod Mandeji, I was really fortunate to, you know, um, have him show us around and the kind of documentation he's done, but also it's supplemented with a number of conservation professionals who are studying these forts, fortifications, documenting them and, you know, making efforts to conserve them. That's good. I'll request uh, the participants if they have any questions to ask. Uh, I see there's a question. Someone asked the Purandar Treaty, uh, which museum houses it? I think you said it's in Bikanet? It's it's in Bikanet. It's the Rajasthan State Archives Museum. So the original treaty was, of course, with uh, Mirza Raja Jaising and it went into the Jaipur archives. But all these archives with the government are, you know, all uh, of entire state are in of Rajasthan are in located in Bikaner. So it is the state Rajasthan state archives located in Bikaner. In fact, we uh, this was a museum that we designed last year and it was a real pleasure, you know, to look at the Purandar Treaty, interpret it and, and display it in this manner. True. Uh, you said in the beginning of your talk that most of the forts in uh, Maharashtra, they are defensive watch uh, forts. Right? Watch forts, yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, uh, how, uh, I mean, it's, it's a personal uh, interest. Uh, uh, how many of these were selected as uh, residential uh, places also by the uh, rulers, ruling dynasties? You know, what were the criteria they would look at to select a port or a place as a residential area for them and to carry on administrative, uh, you know, uh, for, for administrative purposes as well? Yeah, like you can see the case of Raigarh or Rajgarh, you know, where you have a larger area on the plateau, which can expand to have more structures. Uh, also, the water systems, you know, available water systems, there was a complete network. So if you find that kind of, you know, natural spot, and that would be an ideal location. So one is in terms of safety, its location. Second is in terms of its uh, availability of materials like water, food and, and space to build the structures. And all these were generally surrounded by villages below. So, you know, below these, you will have villages which would have paddy fields or other agricultural activity, and they would be sustaining the fort in long term. And during the time of war, I mean, that's where it would have large areas where the local villagers in the surroundings could actually come up and have uh, ref places for refuge also. Um, Shibu Nair has asked, as a citizen, how can I contribute in this endeavor? I mean, it will be great if the public can participate in such programs, if you can just elaborate on that. Sure. The, the Fort Federation of India is exactly an organization, you know, uh, uh, made for this purpose because it was uh, the there are several fort NGOs uh, in uh, Maharashtra and the people themselves from all these uh, uh, smaller NGOs and also individuals actually approached uh, Sambhaji Rajiji that uh, they need an umbrella organization where they can have more community participation, what they want to do for the fort and so, so it's an organization created like an umbrella body, which can actually, you know, um, help uh, such uh, voluntary uh, engagements from people. So, you know, you can just write to Fort Federation of India, and I think they are opening their membership soon. 
and they are of different levels, whether it's individual or, you know, as voluntary or through an organization. Um, and uh, I have, a, okay, um, just one second, there's one question. Uh, yes, so there's a question. First of all, congratulations, Shikhaji, for delivering this wonderful presentation about forts of Maharashtra by giving their chronology with adequate history. One thing I would like to ask, uh, whether you have any proposal for nomination of Gwalior Fort, which is important historically. This is asked by Dr. N.K. Samadhya. Uh, true, I think Gwalior Fort is a very significant fort and it could qualify on the World Heritage List, uh, but it is actually the uh, stakeholders initiative, the owner's initiative, or I mean the body that uh, owns it. And the Gwalior Fort is actually uh, split, uh, part of the area is under ASM, part of the area is under state archaeology. But if either one of them want to propose it for World Heritage, it can be taken forward. It's, um, I would, of course, like to also mention that uh, forts, I mean, there is, you know, the, there is a representation of different categories and forts is actually an overrepresented category already on the World Heritage List. So, so it's very competitive when we are proposing a fort, they really need to be sure that there is no other fort already on the list similar to that. Uh, but, uh, and most of these forts uh, get a lot of stories. Some of them at least get a lot of stories. Uh, will you say that it is a challenge or does it actually help in the conservation of it? So, I mean, because the number of footfalls, which also means a lot of vandalism. Uh, so how do you engage and educate the public about it? And, you know, so that there's a positive uh, role played by them and not actually... Um, create such kind of vandal vandalism uh, for cons conservators. That is a good point. In fact, I missed mentioning it in my presentation because these forts, if you see the design, it's very much blending with the nature and with a sustainable, uh, you know, uh, objective. So in that sense, I mean, in fact, there are details of even the waste, etc., how it needs to be managed historically, you know, it's, they were built in with these kind of uh, um, management um, structure. So I think it is important that people become aware of that. It's more of, you know, making them aware that this is, you know, nature, culture, relationship, and we need, don't need to overuse certain things or misuse uh, in that particular area. But the uh, principles on which it was developed, I think if we just bring that out and uh, make them more sensitive, it should uh, help in controlling. And of course, the other point is that we need to uh, control the tourist footfall also after a certain point, because it has to be as per the capacity of the particular uh, fort or fortification. If you are just overloading it, then it will not be really good. Sure. Uh, Tane Lalwani asks, uh, what major differences do you see in architecture of forts of Rajasthan, Ladakh, and that of Maharashtra? My God, I think it's a very broad question, but if you would like to answer. It, it's, yeah, they're totally different. I mean, the forts in Rajasthan are, uh, of course, stylistically, there is a big difference because they each one is using their local materials. So, I mean, in, in case of Rajasthan itself, the stone is Jaisalmer in case of Jaisalmer, but it is limestone in case of uh, Amer or in case of Kumbalgar. So they vary, the color changes, the styles change, the local style, um, even in Rajasthan, it's changing. Uh, Ladakh is totally different because it is built like the, uh, you know, like the Buddhist monastery kind of a thing. The fortifications are high, but, you know, white lime and it's it's catering to a colder climate um, and whatever materials are available to them for that. I mean, some timber structures like roofing is also there. And in case of uh, Maharashtra, they are completely, as we saw, you know, um, the, the natural uh, features are so dominant that it is just minimal addition to that, which actually defines your fortification. 
So they are, I would say they are very, um, you know, more like for adventure trails and rough in that sense. Whereas in Rajasthan, you would find also because of the Rajput alliance with the Mughals and then the British, it, it's more lavish with, you know, glass in work and palace spaces within the forts. So that whereas in case of Maharashtra, it is very much like for the guerrilla warfare strategy. So, you know. Uh, uh, I would say a very authentic fort, which is just focusing on defense and the basic minimum that is required by people to live in. Will it be okay to say that most of the forts in Rajasthan, they are like, a, because it's a landlocked kind of area. So they were actually uh, not able to probably manipulate the way the uh, forts in Maharashtra are able to manipulate the, you know, the hills and all, and like to have such strong defensive uh, sure. Not really, not really, because the, the six hill forts that are nominated, that are inscribed now, you know, you have Kumbhalgar and Chittorgarh, which actually show the adaptations as hill forts of the Aravlis, which were at one point the highest uh, range. But of course, now, I mean, even with whatever hill, so Chittorgarh is like a hill plateau fort, one of the largest in India, uh, you know, with 340 hectares of area. And Kumbhalgarh is another one, you know, which is has the third largest fort wall in the world after China and Iran. Um, so, and Gagron is actually one of the six, which is a water fort. So, it it uh, Rajasthan has its own, uh, you know, physiographic terrains, and the six hill forts are actually showing how it's adapted to terrain. Like the Jaisalmer one is a desert fort. Then there are two hill forts. There is a hill slope fort and and a hill valley fort. So the difference in that is in the hill slope fort, the, the fort is sprawled across. It's not above on the plateau, uh, but it the main uh, ruler's residence is, is or mehel is right on the top and protected. Whereas a hill valley fort would have all fortifications around and the ruler's uh, main uh, you know residence is or mehel is right in the valley protected, cocoon like that. So there are different, different mechanisms used for defense using the terrain. Um, Aruna asks you, uh, hi, this is Aruna Bakchi. Uh, she said, uh, first of all, uh, really excellent presentation. Um, uh, Thank you, Aruna. Yes, Good and to see you, has, here. Uh, you have taken this, uh, uh, by how, how far you have taken this idea, which you have mentioned when you were working on Chanderi. Uh, from the point of its sari weaving tradition, would love to discuss the whole wider subject with you. I'm not. Um, yeah, so yeah. Uh, she's asking about, uh, you know, there was another tentative list proposal, which is currently on India's tentative list, which is on the sari weaving traditions of India, where we had Chanderi and Petani and, you know, other. So it was actually nominating a serial nomination of all these weaving settlements. So again, I think, I mean, it was a very, it is a very interesting nomination and intact was moving forward with it. But finally, uh, you know, it has to be moved uh, through a government organization. So it's, it's very challenging to find someone across the states, like a central body that would take it up, maybe the Ministry of Textiles or someone should take that up. So it would be a good nomination. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jan. Thank you once again for uh, taking us through this landscape, taking us through all the forts of Maharashtra. And I really hope we are able to have more such public engagement, make people aware, participate more. And congratulations once again for your lovely and such a hard work of faith. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all the participants on behalf of CSMBS for joining us today. Thank you and have a very good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thanks.